Uh, Rob, are you back on? I'm back. Cool. Uh, I don't have video for for some reason. Um, okay. No, for now we'll 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 just uh, we'll get the conversation going because quite frankly, we okay. got people here. Might as well get it going. So I'm sorry that we couldn't provide some video for you guys, but uh, you know, again, thanks for tuning in. Uh, I'll, I'll start with some questions. We'll get a nice discussion going. Um, specifically, I wanted to, you know, ask both of you guys this, uh, and maybe Rob will start with you. But I, I, just in terms of what artists should consider, uh, you know, when it comes to their current live performance skills, their local draw, whatever's happening uh, in their hometown. Uh, before they map out their first tour, how prepared should artists be? Uh, Rob, if you don't mind taking that one. Um, I think experience is important. Um, the many shows you can play in your hometown, you can, you know, figure out what you need to present and what you need as a performer and how to get people to your shows locally. And I mean, even to just ha having the gear and knowing how to do a proper sound check, that's all super important. So some experience makes a lot of sense. I, I personally started at a place called the Aardvark in Fort Worth. We were basically doing cover songs. And uh, I remember showing up with an electric guitar and no amp <laughs> and just being like, what do I do? Plug this thing in direct? <laughs> and uh, the sound guy quickly informed me like, no man, you need to bring an amp and you need to figure this out. So, but you know, everybody starts somewhere. Totally, and, and Bruce, if we can get your perspective from, you know, the booking agent side, uh, you know, again, just yeah. I mean, focusing I, there, on the local, the, the local show. Yeah, I mean, there's a thing we teach at Berkeley um, that uh, we call it being ready for success. And the idea is that, you know, obviously rehearsal and rehearsing a show instead of just songs. I, I'm a big fan of what I call a practice gig, you know, something that's like in your garage or something, because frankly, you're going to suck a lot less the second time. Uh, <laughs> but also the idea that um, you have all the pieces of your of your online presence together, you know, when, when early in your career and throughout your career, when somebody um, discovers you, whether it's a friend told them about you or you're on a radio station or there's a little article somewhere, they're going to go online and try and find you. And if your website isn't there or it sucks or your Facebook page hasn't been updated in six months, it's all going to show. So that's all those things are what, what I sort of put together in the concept of being ready for success, having all the pieces of the puzzle together before or you you go out and seriously play for sure and i think those are skills artists um can sort of start to hone locally right like if you're performing down the street from where you practice having those uh updated you know sites and events and, and social channels is super important but in terms of just you know artists feeling comfortable getting ready to hit the road rob how much were you Forming locally, you know, you just told us that anecdote about you know, playing right. guitar in your first set. But like, in terms of when you finally started to play locally on a regular basis, like how, how often were you doing it before you started heading to nearby regional cities within driving distance? Do we lose Rob entirely? Nope. Oh, I'll be back. Sorry. Um, oh, Rob, sorry about that. Back. Did you hear that last question? <laughs> uh, I did. Um, cool. I s probably did about 30 or 40 shows before organically people started calling. And we ended up booking shows out of state um, and then got more serious about you know actual touring. Um, back to what Bruce just said was just getting experience. Um, audiences c can tell if it's your, like your eighth gig. Like if you don't have the stage present or, um, you know, really don't have your stuff together, it, it doesn't really do you a significant amount of good to go out and just try to do a huge regional tour um, you got to get started somewhere though. And I think 
getting as many shows, getting your set tight, knowing what songs work and what don't are super important. Yeah, I think that's a, it's going to be a recurring theme, right? Like uh, mastering your live show locally and really uh, to, to your point, stage presence, banter, the right set, uh, who to bring on stage, all this stuff is, you know, super important to consider for artists who are starting to play live. Um, totally. You know, but, it, you know, when you do hit the road, uh, you know, or when you're kind of making a planning, Bruce, I had a question as a booking agent, um, you know, for the artists who are following along, you know, we're assuming most of you all don't have a booking agent yet. Um, how do you believe that like artists who are doing the DIY booking can make the best impression uh, when they're reaching out to new venues, maybe within their market, and then again, without, you know, outside of their immediate market? Yeah, I mean, I think, for, first of all, I would say when you start to tour um, outside of your home market, have a purpose. So, you know, if people are calling and saying, hey, come, you know, as they were with Rob, you should go. If you can afford to go, you should go. But, you know, just getting out of town for the sake of getting out of town doesn't necessarily um, cause, you know, um, doesn't necessarily lead to successful outcomes. Or going to play Nashville one time a year uh, may be really cool because you want to play Nashville, but it's not often enough to build an audience, for example. So my first piece of advice is to think about why you're doing it and try and do it with some purpose. Um, but as far as outreach is concerned, um, you know, I'm a believer that you build a touring story, if you will, just like you would any other promotional story. So it's about the places that you've been playing, um, the opening acts that you've done. Even if they're all in your hometown, it's, it tells a story about you. And if you can get a, um, another band or even a club owner in your hometown to recommend you, uh, make an introduction with an email, or even give you a quote to use in your if you will, touring story, that, that goes a long way. So um, it, it is it, like any other uh, portion of your career. It's about building, you know, building blocks and putting together a, a sales story, for lack of a better term, that's uh, focused on your touring. Now, that sales story could include you know, Spotify streams or Facebook followers or all kinds of things, and hopefully it will over time. But in the beginning, it's really probably just about who else you've played with and and uh you know where you played that's interesting and uh you know that's something we talk about when it comes to you know pitching press you know any, any sort of quote you can get about your music and, and use for your advantage uh to get someone else to listen and write about you i you know we don't really talk about that when it comes to booking so i really i think that's some some great advice that artists should take down in terms of if they manage to do a good job where they live uh, you know, use that relationship, uh, try to find someone who will book you again and try to use a quote if you can. Um, Rob, you know, building yep. on that, uh, you know, you mentioned that you would played about 30 or 40 shows, um, mm -hmm. you know, before you really started hitting the road. What did you know though about, you know, booking gigs with menus you didn't have relationships with? What did you have to learn on the way? Um, that's a really good question. Um, a lot of trial and error. Every club owner is somewhat uniquely different. Um, you know, club owners are busy. They're trying to survive. They're trying to bring in acts that can make money. And sometimes it's challenging to, you know, get their attention. Um, definitely having a product that you can sell or have Spotify streams. I love that Bruce is talking about getting a story. Oh, did I go away? No, yeah. No, you're there. Okay. Am I back on? Okay, there we yeah, go. Yeah, yeah. Um, I love that Bruce is talking about getting a story. You can try to partner with other acts, but it, booking's challenging. It's always has been. Um, you have to figure out a way to get attention from the club owners and continue to build your story. Yeah. I mean, answer the question. I, I, if I can just add, <laughs> add on, please, can I add on to that a little bit? Sorry. Totally. Um, one, one, I think great strategy, which Rob just thought of uh, alluded to is um, I'm a big fan of gig trades in the beginning. You know, if you, if you can draw 200 people in 
Austin and you have a friend or know of a band that you think is compatible in Dallas, well, you know, let them come open for you in Austin and you go open for them in Dallas. That's a simple thing. I think, I think that works really well. I, I also, you know, I, when one of the strategies when we're trying to build a band is I'll just, you know, in the broadest terms, it's play where people already are. Uh, so that could be a festival. It could be a free show. It could be, so I, I, as an agent, and I recommend this to artists as well, in addition to chasing, you know, hey, I want to play the club, spend some energy chasing uh, the free city fest or the, you know, mm-hmm. the street fair. It does, I mean, yeah, sure, it's great if it's a big festival, but let's, let's be realistic. Um, it could be a private party. It could be a college gig, something where there are bodies already so that you're not playing to 20 people. If, if, if you can avoid that, do. You may not be able to, but if you can, you should. Yeah, certainly. I mean, that like it goes back to like what we've been talking about, um, being ready to hit the road, but then also being ready to perform for, like you said, more than twenty people. And I think that's something artists should sort of expect to some degree if they're booking out of town gigs. There are going to be those shows where it's less than twenty people, and I don't think that's a reason to get discouraged. It could be a conversation all in of itself. Um, but you know, b- expecting you know lower turnouts. Uh, is is part of the it's part of the uh, journey I think, but uh, if, if if we can shift gears a little bit, I wanted to talk about um, some of the costs and uh, logistics you do with tour. So starting there, uh, you know whether it's a weekend nearby uh, or if it's like an all out week long or two week long tour that you've booked, uh, I wanted to discuss from both your angles some of the less than obvious costs that artists should uh, take into consideration as they account as they budget uh, for their gigs on the road. Uh, Rob, I'll start with you. You know, some things you've learned along the way in terms of budgeting for your first tours. Right. Um, back to 20 people, that gets tough. You start losing a lot of money. It's just hmm. realistic. Um, having a professional touring operation, you have to start looking at, obviously, gas, hotels, van, van rental, um, insurance, you know, having an insurance policy for your van or an ant to, to um, protect liabilities. Um, you know, a lot of things like sound cost and, and really knowing what your deal is at the club or festival or private event. I'll, you, you get that information ahead of time and you need to look at it before you go out. Um, and inevitably you might lose money, but knowing how much money, at least roughly you're going to lose is really important. And adversely, I feel like having a product to sell, whether that be t-shirt koozies, great margin, um, you know, CDs are kind of out these days. Uh, maybe vinyl, having something to sell at a show uh, can really make that margin work for you. Totally. And Bruce, uh, from the other perspective, as, a, as, a, as an agent who's, you know, I mean, I love talking to Rob because it's firsthand experience, but I also love hearing from someone who's, you know, worked with a, a multitude of artists and has seen different costs show up. What, what, what are some things you've seen um, artists kind of run into as far as budgeting? Well, I just lost you at the end there. Can you, can you hear me okay? We can hear you, yeah. Okay, good. Um, I, no, I, I mean, I think every the, – the trick the, – it's hard to answer that question because every artist is different. And the, sure. you know, are you a solo artist? Are you the per, kind of person that's willing to sleep on somebody's floor? Or do you need your own hotel room with a private bathroom? So every, everybody's different. And being realistic about that, like Rob said, understanding the, the – amount of money you're actually going to make boosting that money by, by having a decent merch operation is really important. You know, one thing that I find uh, effective for artists early in their career are house concerts, for example, because often they'll give you a place to stay uh, and they'll certainly feed you. And it's way more fun to play for 30 people in somebody's living room than it is 30 people in somebody's club. So, you know, there's, there are strategies like that as well that, you know, don't, they they address the cost issue in a backwards way, you know, meaning that there'll be less of them because they'll feed you and how, uh, 
and you and you'll you'll make the same or more money and a more pleasant experience. So it's it you know it 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 is hard. This this part of the business is as hard as every other part of the business, maybe harder, um, and it's getting harder because artists aren't making money from streaming, and therefore they're going on the road more, and there's more competition. Um, but you know these kind of creative things, and they're different for every band. But these kind of creative ideas um, can 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 net results. Yeah, and I think you know we've we've talked about um, home concerts uh, on the TuneCore blog before. We have some successful TuneCore artists who have uh, really found their lane there, um, and I think that's you know I, I think it's as much as uh, to do with your fan base as Rob mentioned, like with vinyl. Like vinyl is not going to be an option for everyone. We know that. It's uh, do, right. does your fan base consume that sort of thing? Does your fan base uh, what, would they be interested in a home concert? Th those those are the things that artists kind of have to figure out for themselves a little bit. Um, and I think you know, there's more than enough ways to sort of engage with fans and figure out what they want. It is really just sort of putting yourself out there. Um, I do want to talk about um, for some folks maybe who haven't played out as much or played on the road. Um, just some general sort of like venue talent buyer. Uh, etiquette, and, and when I say talent buyer, for everyone listening, that just means basically the person who's uh, who's who's booking you at a, at a given club or gig, uh, excuse me, venue. Um, so you just talk about some of the etiquette and, and advice you'd have for artists who are booking new gigs. Rob, again, just from the artist perspective, is there anything you kind of had to learn along the way as far as that bot, like that talent buyer etiquette goes? Um, back to every person's different, every club's different, but but those people are your gateway to that market. They know everyone generally that is doing a festival or the bigger clubs and they hopefully talk, talk to each other. And so coming into a new environment and in trying to get a gig with someone at a club, let's say, let's just use a little rock. So, the guys in Little Rock own a place that uh, called Sticky Fingers, small, 200 cap room. They also have a 900 cap um, room called the Rev Room, uh, booked by one person. Um, you want to come in with that person and have no attitude and be super gracious, um, kind of be willing to be the opener and – you might not get a great sound check. You might be super early in the night, but it's your ch chance to get in front of that person. If they like you, they believe in you, then you might get called back for a bigger gig. Um, you might be able to play Little Rock for 10 years and they'll help you grow your career. So I just, I still work with the same talent buyers from 10 years ago and having those relationships makes booking gigs much easier. So definitely a relationship based and, you know, um, building those relationships, but also fostering them. As Rob said, he's been working with the same people for over 10 years in some markets. Bruce, did you have any, you know, sort of on the other end uh, experience, like whether it's drawing from personal experience yeah, no, I mean you've worked with or, yeah, everything Rob's saying is 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 right. I, I might add to it. Um, the harder you work uh, you know, to make your biggest success, uh, that gets noticed. So if they see that you came into town early in the day and visited the college radio station, or did an in store, you know, at, at the little local, you know, indie store, or, or all of those kind of things, those things do not go unnoticed. So mm -hmm. if you see a band, on, if you're a talent buyer and you see a band on stage uh, that, you know, hey, they're pretty good and they worked hard, meaning they're trying, doing everything they can to help be successful, um, I think that goes a long, a long way as well. Um, I'm also a, a huge fan of, of thank you notes afterwards. Like if, if it went well, say thank you, you know, and, and frankly, honestly, as old school as it sounds, maybe even do it, you know, in ink and not, not just an email because emails get lost. But, you know, whatever you can, as, as Rob suggests, to sort of ingratiate yourself to that person is, is going to go a long way. I'm a big fan of thank you notes in all aspects of life. So I appreciate that. I really do think it goes a long way, like Bruce said. And they'll remember that if you send them a handwritten note saying, thank you for booking me, thank you for putting this up, whatever it might be, 
uh, I think that's a super reasonable, easy way to, to maintain and build that relationship a little bit. Um, Bruce, I want to talk to you, you know, because I want to get into the logistics a little bit, but you started talking about, uh, you know, in stores and, and, and local radio stations, and stuff like that, stuff that build toward, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. But I wanted to just talk about, uh, uh, you know, based on your experience, in what kind of key ways concert and tour promotion has changed for indie artists in the last decade in terms of what they need to focus on now? I'm sorry, what they need to focus on in terms of marketing? Is that the question? So, yeah, concert and tour promotion generally, just like, like yeah. they're coming to town. Well, yeah, I mean, we I, well, yeah, I, I think that the simple rule is that uh, assume that no one is promoting the show but you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and they may call mm -hmm. themselves promoters, but, you know, they're also um, – counting beer, you know, how many cases of beer do they have to sell on Saturday night? So they're busy and they've got 10 or 20 or 30 shows that month. And the one that matters to you is you. So start with the premise that you're the only one promoting. Um, most tickets are sold and most interest is sold. It happens when the show goes on sale and in the final, let's say 10 days before the show. So be sure you announce strong and be sure you, you, you know, don't give up in those, those last 10 days when people are trying to decide. Um, obviously social media matters. I'm, I'm still a fan of Facebook paying for Facebook boosts. I mean, there's all kinds sure. of tricks we could go into, but that, which is its own webinar, but it's just basically the idea that you are responsible and doing everything that you can to help make the show a success. And then when you're there capturing every fan's, email address or capturing them in some way so that if there's 30 people in a room and you can get 20 email addresses, that's, you know, that's 40 or 50 people that might come to your next show when you're back in town. So being there and, and, and having them love you, but having no way to communicate with them, it's almost like it didn't happen. So do everything that you possibly can to capture that email address. You know, following you on social media is great, but Will Facebook be here in 10 years? I don't know. You know, it's uh, so it, certainly MySpace isn't here uh, as it was 10 years ago. And, and we used to tell bands to spend hours building their following <laughs> there. So capture your face and, and uh, um, you know, be able to communicate with them. Also, just back to the merch thing, and this is also capture thing. The, you will sell infinitely more merch if you go out to the table afterwards. If you announce it from the stage and then you go out to the table afterwards. Signed items uh, outsell unsigned items most almost two to one, for particularly for indie bands. And you think, who wants my autograph? Eh, you know, you'd be surprised. So, yeah. you know, get out there and do it and and have a uh, have a sign up sheet for your email list on, on the on that table and ask people to sign up. It's as simple as that. Well, as a uh, former MySpace teenager who loved to go to local shows and found out about them through MySpace, it's nice uh, thinking about that. But you're absolutely yeah. right. Uh, I, I mean, we really um, emphasize the underrated importance of an email list, right? Uh, you know. I think it's easy to dismiss, but uh, as Bruce said, when you're in a room with people and you can get them to sign up because they like your set, you have uh, instant direct connection with them. You don't doesn't mean sending out super spammy marketing posts. You can really connect with people over email, uh, and anyone who takes the time to do that is already invested in you. So it's totally worth um, paying attention to. And, and to Bruce's point, just being there, just being present behind the merch booth, which I'm sure Rob has plenty of experience with. Uh, Rob, I did want to um, chat with you just sort of like, or excuse me, chat with you, we're chatting. Uh, I did want to ask you, um, you know, just the importance of breaking into nearby markets uh, and preparing for longer stretches. You know, how did you, um, how did you start to sort of take advantage of the out of town dates and building those relationships with fans, building those relationships with local uh, industry people and venues? Can you talk a little bit about that as far as uh, like like nearby uh, dates go? We actually might have lost Rob. I don't see him. Oh, geez. Let's see if we can get him back in here. Well, Bruce, I'll ask you. Well, we we can we can go into another topic here, but. Um, uh, th th and thanks for talking a little bit about no, like, the way concert and tour promotion is is, is changed because you started you started outside of the show and went right into the show and how important it is to just be there. Um, when we get Rob back, I did want to talk about this a little bit too, but I want to talk to you specifically about like routing 
and logistical lessons that you've seen bands and artists kind of have to learn firsthand over the years, um, whether it's, you know, you're picking some shows or picking well, some venues because they're nearby, but then routing it wrong, sure. or, you know, just any logistical errors. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I, I, there's two things. Two, there are kind of three things I think about. One is obviously, if you get a good, a really great gig and it's a festival or whatever, you want to go do it. So you, so do it. So everything now that I'm about to say will goes out the window when that happens. But as far as the day to day touring is concerned, there's two things you know I like to think about. One is, you know, sort of working in concentric circles outside of your home city. So sort of making a circle and saying, well, what's 50 miles or, or an hour or something and, and playing those markets and working and then making those circles sort of ever bigger. The reason that's important is back to the comment I made earlier about Nashville. And that is if you're only going to play a market once a year early in your career before you have, you know, massive radio play, et cetera, the audience is going to forget you. So the question is, you know, can, where, what are the places you can play that you can go back to uh, semi-regularly? The, so aside from concentric cir circles, or we call it hub and spokes touring, um, there's straight line touring. And that is, I know I need to play Nashville because I'm an Americana act or I'm a singer, singer songwriter or whatever it is. And so draw a line between you and Nashville and what are the cities between you and Nashville that you want to play um, and build uh, so that you can go to Nashville on a regular basis. So it's it's all about what you can do on a regular basis. I mean, we'll have bands come to us that we'll sign that are doing, you know, 750 people in six Midwestern cities. And they're like, we want to go play the country. And we're like, mm, let's let's uh, concentrate on the Northeast. Wow, there you are. Hey, what's up, Rob? <laughs> Just in um, case hey, you guys were worried what Rob looked like, our... he's here. Yeah, there we go. Um, anyway, we'll say go play a certain region and build that region and, and build the country one region at a time because you do need to be able to go back to that region long, uh, often enough, frequently enough to have an impact. So that, that, that's the under, underlying rule is where, where am I going to play? Uh, where do I want to, to play that I can actually go back to often enough to build? Because if you can't, you can have a great show and then you're forgotten. Yeah, I think that's uh, super important to think about, you know, um, uh, I'm sure a lot of people in this webinar are, are based in the states here. So it's, it is about thinking your area, thinking about your area, excuse me, uh, you know, personally, like being in New York, right? We think about Philly, we think about Boston and Connecticut and all the places you can go in between. And, you know, artists over here are kind of lucky in that sense. But if you're based in Kansas City, it, it, these are longer drives, some of the markets are trying to hit. Uh, and, and Rob, you had, you had cut out, but I wanted to get mm -hmm. your, uh, your, your uh, follow up on that in terms of just like routing and logistical sort of lessons that you've had to learn along the way. Uh, if you have any personal experiences with, you know, a misrouted tour or just some lessons you learned along the way, let us know. Can you all hear me? Yes. By the way. Okay, good. Um, yeah, routing is extremely important. I mean, it's not always going to be perfect. Um, it's just, it's not, uh, you're going to have to probably put in the time sometimes to go do that six to 12 hour drive, um, which gets expensive. Um, but ideally you like, I was once told when I first started in this business by the record label president that was like, draw a circle on a map and then keep making it bigger. And so you just got to correctly route your tour out to maybe you can only hit the Northeast um, twice a year. But, you know, back to what Bruce was saying was like, how are you going to promote the show? Does it make sense? I started when we had basically MySpace, no Spotify, and we would jump in the van and just go to like Oxford, Mississippi and hmm. <laughs> there would be like a poster on the door. And, and that, I think that was the only way the show was promoted. And I think we hit college radio, but the more that you can use Spotify statistics, bands in town statistics, anything to know where your audience is, then going those extra miles and spending that extra money makes sense to me because you can at least judge. I've got 800 followers in Denver. Well, for me to go to Denver, that's a 15 hour drive. And, you know, you can go through New Mexico, the panhandle of Texas, and then go up through Colorado Springs or something. But 
what makes sense? And are you going to get the most bang for your buck by getting there, getting email addresses, selling merch, adding Instagram followers, and just keep building something? Sure. And I mean, you know, it, it presents an opportunity to hit some, um, you know, less than fashionable markets. If you if you don't know the area and it's not some quote unquote music town, right? guess what? It still has music fans and they're still interested and they still want to see you. So uh, I think there's a certain um, goodwill that goes towards hitting some markets that you might not necessarily think about. So it's, it's, a, it's a net positive for you and for the Lowell's and it's another place to hit. I mean, I have, you know, friends and artists who have talked about some of their, uh, you know, favorite cities to hit being totally off the map as far as uh, totally. most artists concerned. And it's because they, the, the level of support they get there because they make it and they build relationships there. Um, we're definitely going to get in some bands in town specific questions. But um, before we do, I did want to just sort of talk about um, securing dates and sort of how to reach out. So um, I would love to get both of your perspective on this. It's probably very similar given uh, your respective experience, but I want to talk about when you're getting ready to do like a, a week long tour, let's say um, outside of your region or nearby cities, maybe some included, how long should artists be, uh, how long in advance should artists be reaching out to venues to secure dates? Uh, Rob, I'll start with you. Uh... I don't know. Uh, Bruce might or might not agree with me. At least four months, hopefully. I mean, there's a lot of artists these days. I mean, we all know what this, there's a lot of independent artists and a lot of people are competing for shows and rooms. And you, as the more lead way you have, I think the more success uh, in getting a date. Uh, I'd also say when you're approaching somebody specifically, try to narrow down what dates you want and what you're looking for and make it super concise and be very obviously polite, but just like, this is what I'm looking for. This is what I'm trying to accomplish. And let me know if you have that available date open. Um, a little bit back to rounding for a second. Like if you're grabbing, if you know you have one date, then you need to draw a circle around that date. And hopefully it's a good anchor date and you can look at wherever you can, you're trying to hit. Um, and sometimes if people say no for that club, go find another one and see what can happen basically. Um, and just <laughs> booking is everybody's trying to get a show. So you just have yeah. to see what you can offer, you know? Yeah. And Bruce, would you, would you echo that, uh, uh the, the four week, uh, yeah, hundred percent. I mean, six, six, six months out, you know, I mean, yeah. we're, we're working nine months out now because it's just getting so tough out there. And, and because I can get better routing, you know, it, there's nothing worse than, you know, you want to play this city and the club is already booked, you know, I mean, and, and they would book you if they weren't booked, but, but they're already booked. So what are they going to do? Throw the other band out there? Not. So, you know, working at Rob is right. Working out as far as you can, now there's some of them are not going to work that far out. You know, you're going to, you've got a nine day tour, you're going to get four or five dates and then you're going to be scrambling four months out for that, you know, the last two or something. It's just, just the way it is. But um, the farther out you can go, the better it is. He's all, also, I would echo the, the idea of narrowing it down. If you say to somebody, I'm coming out to Colorado in the first two weeks of, uh, you know, January, they're, they're lost at that point. I mean, they, they may, the more that you can be specific about what you want and shift a little bit, but the more you can ask a specific question, the more you're going to get a specific answer. There's also a concept that, you know, most indie artists are not work, used to, and that's called holds. So basically you get in, you, you ask for a hold, meaning, yes, I, we've agreed if I can route the rest of my tour, I will play on that night for that money. You have sort of a mutual agreement with the buyer. Uh -huh. And then you, so that gives you a little bit of time to run out and go find the other dates around it. Now, sometimes you're not going to be the first hold. Sometimes you're going to be the second hold or the third hold. And that means by, that when you're ready to confirm, they've got to go to the other two bands uh, at, for, uh, and, at first and say, do you want the show or not? And, and when they don't, because you got, you know, you're thinking six months or whatever, you get the date. Anyway, I'm just explaining this idea of holds because the worst thing you can do is say yes to a date, confirm a date, and then go back and cancel it because you didn't get the other tour dates or because the routing didn't work out because the cities aren't sure. in the right order. So, 
So don't, don't be afraid to have those conversations. And, and the, the talent buyer will appreciate your honesty. Um, but also, just one last thing on holds, make sure they write them down. Like, you know, <laughs> what hold am I? Am I first hold? Yeah. You know, sure. they're really trying to try and pin them down uh, and, and so that they're, it's actually written down somewhere. I'm in line for that date. I think that's uh, an incredibly important note that Bruce just touched on because uh, aside from specifically talking about holds, uh, it really speaks to the notion of just being honest, uh, opening communication with the people that you're trying to book with, making their lives as easy as possible in a way that can benefit both the club and yourself as an artist. Um, I think that's super underrated. I think people are trying, you know, maybe in their um, endless effort to be professional or to be cool, um, maybe won't be as open and honest as they can be when it comes to some of this stuff. And they're just trying to uh, spin a lot of plates at the same time. So, uh, you know, if that's one thing artists can walk away with here, I say, you know, absolutely be open and communicative with the people that you're trying to book with. Um, you know, I think as Bruce just put it, it really will go a long way and they'll appreciate it. Um, I wanted to get into a little bit about Bands of Town. Again, for everyone joining, if you aren't on Bands of Town, you haven't downloaded Bands of Town, this is not a sponsored podcast, excuse me, a webinar. I'm just a fan of Bands of Town and I recommend it. I recommend artists take advantage of it. Um, I know Rob has experience using it. And I kind of wanted to talk to Rob both about the effectiveness of it and then Bruce, just some of the new features that are rolling out. So Rob, if you could talk a little bit about how you've utilized Bands of Town um, for your touring efforts, you know, we'd love to hear about it. Definitely. Um, Bands in Town obviously came up and we started noticing that that was kind of the main platform that people, when we were announcing shows that it would go directly to our fans. And then I would start getting text messages from people be like, you're coming back to here. You're coming back to there. And as we've grown our Bands in Town followers somewhere around a little north of 13,000 people like nice. I can really judge what markets to go to by the response of getting RSVPs. Um, you know, if we're having a show that's a little light and we're not selling the tickets the right way, we can use bands in town to promote the show better. And just, I mean, simply sometimes shows are just, you're not the fans didn't get the message that y'all were playing there. And that's where bands in town really can help because you can figure out how many fans you have in that town and, and make, you know, send them the show. Um, I really like it. I think it's at one point in time, we were going to six different websites to announce a show and bands yeah. in town has take that into one thing. And that's the only way we announce shows. Now I go to bands in town artists back end and that pushes out to everything. Um, which is, I mean, back in the day to do six different places to place a show. It's just, it, it didn't make any sense. Um, yeah. And it, re it reinforces the need for, you know, uh, keeping up with your, with your fans on social media and tying that into it totally. as well. Right. Cause yeah. we can't, Continuity. as much as we'd like every, you know, uh, audience attendee or concert attendee to be as plugged in and using men's sound, maybe it just takes a like on Facebook. Right. You just kind of have to realize that people have as much as you can be an artist and be excited about what you're doing. You have to realize that people are in their day-to-day -day lives and they do want to get out and see a show and hopefully they're a fan of yours, but you know, you want to, you want to, you might have to approach them multiple different ways through Facebook ads and all this stuff just to get somebody's actual conversion to buying a ticket. Um, totally. But, I mean, a lot of, of stuff. Yeah, totally. Bands of town is a huge tool. Cool. And Bruce, um, you know, if you want to talk a little bit about some of the new features that, or, you know, newer features that Bands in Town is offering artists these days, just sort of in terms of fan engagement and, and how Bands in Town helps artists promote their shows and helps them keep in touch with fans after the fact. Sure. Um, first of all, I think the big takeaway is if everybody needs to understand that all of the artist tools on Bands in Town, all of them are free. So it, they cost you nothing, and 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 there there is no intention whatsoever ever to change that. Um, that's it's a core mission to the company, and also that you know Bands in Town is just a huge platform. There are 55 million registered users, 530,000 registered artists. We promoted 2.5 million dates last year. That's how many were were on the platform. That's globally, but more than 60% of it's in the U.S. So it's a it's a big tool. 
if you um, use the Bands in Town widget, which Rob does, you know, in other words, put the, the, you enter the dates once, they go all, all kinds of places on the web, but they're also, you can, uh, they automatically post your website. Rob has a feature that it, it, almost all our widgets have. You can turn it off, but most people don't, called Play My City which actually allows uh, – do you even know that it's there? Yes. <laughs> um, oh, yeah, definitely. It's at the bottom of, yeah. of, of, of the page, of his web page, and it says, uh, you know, hey, I'm in Cleveland, Rob. Why aren't you playing Cleveland? And it allows you to track that and know even places you don't play where your fans are, and there's free analytics. The big tool, though, is the messaging. So if they follow you on, on Bands in Town, and Rob has 13,000-something followers. I looked at it earlier – they automatically get a message when Rob uh, comes to within 50 miles of their, their town. But Rob can also go and message them anytime about anything, anytime, anytime he wants. doesn't even have to be about a tour date. He can message all of his fans about a new record release, or he can geotarget his messaging to his fans, let's say, in, in Dallas. Um, and all of that is for free. So at the risk of, of, of you know, pitching too hard, you, you've got to do social media. You've got to do all these other things. I'm not saying you don't. You absolutely do. But when you post on Facebook, you're lucky if, I don't know, 6 to 15, to if you're really lucky, 30% of your followers um, see that. If you're on Bands in Town and you've got 13,000 followers, unless they've specifically opted out of messages, uh, there are, those 13,000 people are, are getting, getting whatever you send them. Um, and our biggest you know, upgrades this year have been the geotarget. So you don't have to bug all your fans all your time, all the time. You can just, you know, message the ones that you want, and an increase in some of the analytics to tell you where your fans are, uh, et cetera. And there's there's some more things on the roadmap involving festivals and stuff that we'll be involved um, announcing over the coming weeks. But it's all of this is free. That's the big message: free. That's huge. Um, you know, again, I have to just say it as a music fan uh, living in a city with a lot of venues as a destination city that a lot of independent artists that I happen to be a fan of want to hit. Uh, I utilize it, you know, because uh, as everyone said, it's like you, people are busy. It's, it's really easy to take advantage of as a fan. And I think um, as Bruce and Rob have expressed here, it's really easy to take advantage of as an artist. So I really encourage everyone to check that out. Uh, what I wanted to do now was just sort of address some of the questions we've been getting in the, in the chat. So I'll start with uh, one for, for you guys. Um, you know, it's it actually kind of, it plays to myself as a Tinkor employee, obviously too, but it says, do you recommend having a certain number of songs uploaded to your sites uh, before asking a booking agent or a venue uh, manager to book a local show. So it's just about how much music should you have available uh, in your pitch, which I think is pretty reasonable. Uh, uh, Bruce, do you want to handle that one? Well, I, I mean, I can't imagine that one song's enough, but I can also imagine that ten songs is too many. So uh, if I, if if you know, people have short attention spans. If they're interested, they're going to want to dig two or three deep. So I'd probably say three is the number. I'd also say, okay. honestly, if one of them can be a video, a live video, even if it's a mediocre live video. I mean, let's face it. When you hear about a band, most people go to YouTube because they can hear them, they can see them. So you might as well just give them that experience. They're, they're, you're asking them to book you live. So even if it's just a halfway decent fan cell phone video that shows that you were playing in front of a few people and they were excited, um, that goes a long way. Cool. I think that's a great tip, and I, I, you know, you're definitely not the first person I've heard mention that. Um, as far as assets to have on hand when you're reaching out to to, to talent buyers, I, I don't think it's something to look over. Um, Rob, this one's for you. Um, someone asked in the chat, "Do you have any tips for finding local artists um, in new areas to hop on a bill with?" I think that's a big one, right? Like if you're within right. a, a certain amount of distance from a territory and you want to link up with some bands, but you've never been there. It's, you know, how, how do you, how do you meet these folks and how do you uh, hop on a bill? You know, that's tough. Things have changed since like, I'd say 10 years ago, a lot of younger artists were out playing smaller shows, but a lot of people are making music in their bedrooms now and go, go through a lot of steps or maybe go a lot quicker. Um, it doesn't seem sometimes as there is much of a local scene, but I would go once you have your music and look at your related artists and see like kind of who is listening to your other songs and on Spotify and Apple music. And you see that 
maybe this artist is in, you know, a town that's 150 miles away from you or 200 miles away from you and you try to, you know, reach out to them, reach out to their manager, whatever that may be. Um, definitely just looking for other like artists and looking at, I mean, it, it, it's archaic, but going to websites of venues that you want to play and looking at someone that you could pair up with, um, that you could present yourself for support to a buyer um, is, it still is, could work. I mean, it still works. Um, maybe not all the time, but it's definitely an approach that makes sense. Yeah, I think that's great. And um, someone asked a question, which I think kind of draws back to our uh, earlier discussion about local shows, local draw. Uh, someone asked, what is the, we, we kind of talked about the best way to build your local fan base. Um, but how, how do you, how do you build the fan base without sort of diluting it? How many shows is too many when it comes to playing local gigs? Someone asked. And I think that's a super important question because uh, for those, you know, maybe you don't have a vehicle, maybe you, you, you just don't have the set to go out on tour yet but you're getting a ton right. of opportunity to play live. How do you, how do you sort of uh, balance that? Uh, and I'll give it, I'll, I'll let you both answer this, but Rob, if you want to, if you want to jump on that one. I think as your fan base grows, you can be more particular about what plays you want to do in a market. You definitely don't want to burn out a market, especially when it's local, but um, uh, there's no particular, I mean, Ideally, Austin's my hometown market. Ideally, we want to play it two times a year, um, unless some type of festival situation pops up. But as you grow, you've got to grow your fan base, but it's a very delicate situation because you can't, you're going to start with friends and family and then friends of friends and family. But if you do that every week, then you're, you're going to burn people out. So you just have to be very delicate about how you approach your shows and are you bringing something different to this show? Maybe you bring, you know, a special guest or someone you're playing with or a different type of musical setup and you can make different unique things or maybe you do a Halloween show or something like that. Just finding things to make each show unique as you grow, I think is important. For sure. And Bruce, in terms of, uh, you know, working with artists uh, over the years, what have you seen uh, work and not work when it comes to, you know, maybe playing locally uh, either too much or not enough? Uh, do you have any, any input there? Yeah. I mean, I, yeah, I mean, I think early, you know, Rob is talking about somebody who's got a fairly mature career, particularly in, in certain markets and he doesn't want to overplay often, but in the beginning, I'm sure he played almost every gig everybody asked him to do, if you will. I mean, I'm, 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 most artists do that. And I don't think there's any shame in that. You, you need to, um, you know, not burn your audience out. So that's probably somewhere in the once a month kind of range. But it's also true that even in a place like Austin, there's a club on the east side and a club on the west side. And, the, you know, it's slightly different audiences. So think about those things. Uh, two other strategies. One he, he alluded to, and that was, you know, make, each, make a date an event. You know, it's your birthday party, it's Halloween, it's, you know, a great pairing of an outside bill, it's a special guest, it's a, you know, we're doing, a, you know, a second set of all Beck songs because we love Beck. I mean, whatever that, that thing might be, um, I, I think is really important. And then the, you know, I lost my train of thought of what the, what the second idea was, I have to be honest, but, but, but the idea basically is, is, is to make things an event. So, I, you know, I think, I think that has a lot of merit. And I think that's something, um, you know, as we talk about maybe some of the technical side of this stuff, the logistical side of the stuff that uh, keeps coming up is really just like, what are you doing live? What is making your show um, better with each performance? What is, you know, bringing fans back in? What's bringing fans in when you get to the new, to the new area, right? Like what's keeping them in the room? We all know sometimes a middling band comes on and if they don't catch a our attention within a certain amount of times so we're going out and grabbing a drink or we're going out and talking with friends. Um, you know, so I think it, it really does come back to the importance of, uh, developing that, that, uh, that live act in that live performance and, and always working on it, but keep it in an evolving, um, thing that you're, that you're constantly building. Another question right. uh, that came uh, up I'm, in the, in the chat. Thing, Mike, I, I actually, can I interrupt you? 
One sec. I, I remembered my thought, and I've actually something I've done effectively, and that is residencies. And mm -hmm. that is, cool. you know, you play the same the same venue every Wednesday for three months or something. And uh, sure. I've I've actually booked tours of residencies in New England where they play the same place every Tuesday, same place every Wednesday. But even if you're doing it in your hometown, because you know, if the fans like you, uh, they will tell their, they will bring fans next Wednesday. And if you can, if the ticket price is low and you can turn it into a hang, it may be, it's, it can be an effective way to build an audience and therefore play the market more often, uh, than you would otherwise. And I think it's great too, if you're a fan and you can't make it this Wednesday, you can make it next Wednesday, right? Rob, have you had any uh, experience with residencies? Definitely. I was going to piggyback up Bruce a little bit. Um, I've done some residencies, especially starting out early, um, and at least like it's name reinforcement, and and it's people gets people talking like, oh maybe it's a Wednesday and they don't come this week, but then it's on their schedule and Wednesdays are pretty you know light and people want to come out and support. Also to that, uh, playing acoustic shows or something where you're not spending you can just go out. You're not as worried about the money or you don't have the band behind you. I mean, if you are in a band then y'all can all go for it. Um, but just doing, you're going to build up your stage presence and you're going to learn a lot and how your song should be played. Um, and you're going to, you know, it's, it's fairly low risk. There's really no risk at all. So trying to do things that give you the most experience and, I mean, there's no better experience than standing behind a microphone with your instrument, trying to present that to a crowd. And if you get them, then I think you learn a lot. Yeah. Um, you know, we are coming up on the hour mark, so I kind of wanted to start to wrap things up. I appreciate everyone getting their questions in. Um, and I appreciate Bruce and Rob for joining me. I did want to just sort of uh, give Rob and Bruce the chance for like a last minute brief uh, advice, a piece of advice to any artist who's thinking about hitting the road. Uh, Rob, I'll start with you. Um, it's very easy Sorry, to get discouraged. Hit random one there. No, that's, a, that's, a, that's good. It's very easy to get discouraged. Um, it, 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 nothing happens overnight. That's just, it, it, it's very, I mean, it's just evident and true. So developing your craft and then treating people the best that you can and being kind and nice and and then just working really hard are all the things that it takes to develop a career. I think some luck plays into it, but you know, you might start with three songs in a video, and then five years later you might have, you know, three EPs and in a couple proper music videos and see your career growing in the right ways. But it's just taking your time, using the tools that you have around you and being nice and working your ass off, basically. Well, that's great advice. Uh, Bruce, any advice for artists who are thinking about hitting uh, the road or, or just starting to build their local draw? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I would say whatever it is, have a goal and, and you know, understand what it is you're trying to accomplish. Be, be realistic, obviously, about it. You know, you're not going to go from zero to 100 miles an hour and touring nationally in a year, necessarily. It happens very occasionally, but almost never. So have a goal, understand what they are, and then measure your uh, success along the way. You know, I keep a little diary of I did. I played this club and I did 40 people, but it was snowing, so I forgive myself. Uh, you know, for only 40 people being there. So you know, think about what it is you want to accomplish, measure it along the way, and then you know, look. So much about marketing and 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 everything is do more of what works and less of what doesn't. So if you're paying attention, you know, and it doesn't work for you to play Birmingham, Alabama, even though you think it should, well, maybe don't play Birmingham, Alabama. You know, it's no offense to Birmingham. I apologize. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's, I think it's really about having goals and measuring your success and your failure along the way. Totally. Um, and, you know, I'd be remiss not to mention that TuneCore offers um, artists uh, analytics that basically will let you know where your fans are listening. Uh, and I cannot promote that enough. Uh, I think it's 
an understated value of TuneCore among artists sometimes is uh, really looking at those analytics, seeing where people are. I mean, obviously platforms like Spotify will tell you where your listeners are coming from, but really um, paying attention to those to those uh, those cities and, uh, and and giving them some attention when you need to. Um, I, I know someone in the chat had a very specific question about um, local promoters in Europe, and I'm sorry, we're not gonna get to that, but it, we, we can try to answer that offline. Um, but I just wanted to say thank you to everyone uh, for participating today, for joining in, um, and to my guests, Rob and Bruce. I think one thing we learned today is that, you know, there's only so much you can cover in a webinar, and I think we're gonna have to uh, maybe cover a little bit more ground uh, moving forward. So I just wanted to say thank you guys. Thank you very much. I enjoyed Thank you this. very much. Cool. Well, again, uh, nice to you, meet you, Rob. We, we, you too. <laughs> <laughs> you might have a new artist. Uh, we'll uh, we'll get this up online in a recap as well, and we'll have a video for everyone to check out, uh, share, review, whatever it might be. Uh, so yeah, just thanks for everyone uh, for joining, and uh, we hope this uh, helped answer some questions. And you guys are getting ready to hit the road soon.